ko beidzās. Gan jau sadiksimies vairāk, mazāk uz priekšu apakaļ. Nedaudz tehnikas informācijas. Tātad prezentācija būs Anna Valodā. Mēs netulkojam speciāli. Tā iemesta pēc, lai nezaudētu vienkārši laiku. Visi prezentācijas tiks nopilmēta un visiem tiks izsūti attiecīgie līgi, to arī to prezentāciju varētu novēlēt. Tieši tāpat tās kā prezentācijas Pārtu prezentāciju, nu, arī būs pieejami un arī būs jūtējums no labi. Nu jā, un lūdzu būt aktīviem, tad ir brīdīt, ka jums jautājumi jautājiet. And let me introduce on behalf of all of us, on behalf of Latin Hockey Federation, head coach of national team, Stanley Cup winner, and really good man. Bob Hart. Thank you. Five years, lived in, yeah. tried to practice as much as I, as I did over the, four, the, the last week because I was hoping to give the full presentation in, uh, in Latvian language, but I'm not there yet. And players only showed me bad words, so like, I, can't, uh, I can't use this. Let me introduce you my partner, Jacques Cloutier. Jacques uh, has played in the NHL as, as a goaltender for over like 12 years and uh, he's been with me for, for 12 years. We, we were in the American Hockey League with the Quebec Nordiques and uh, the Colorado Avalanche farm team. Then we were in Colorado uh, together. Then we went to Zurich in the Swiss League uh, to coach the Lions and uh, we spent the last four years together in, uh, in Calgary. Also, Peter Osgolms, Peter, I met Peter uh, during our four-day camp. Peter is the video coach of uh, the uh, Dynamo Riga, and he is, he is very good. I want to thank the Federation, Latvian Hockey Federation, for you know, like giving me an opportunity to come here and you know, like work with the national team, but also work with the coaches. I started to coach, I was 26 years old. And uh, I did lots of seminars like this, lots of seminars. And, you know, like, obviously, we're, we're going to go from noon to uh, 1.15, and then we'll take a 30-minute break, and then we're going to go from 13.45 to, to 15, uh, 15 hours. Us, we, we don't work that way, but, you know, 1.45 to 3. And obviously, there's going to be lots of talk. He, uh, I will do most of the talking, but at any time, please, you know, like, we do this for you. You know, I was working in a windshield plant, and I start to coach, and if someone in the windshield plant would have told me one day you're going to be working in the NHL, and one day you'll be the national uh, Latvian ice hockey coach, I, would, I wouldn't have believed them. You know, but I, I learned about coaching, I kept learning about the game, and you know, it's so much fun. And as you know, we're working with kids, we're working with five-year-old kids, eight-year-old kids, 12-year-old kids, 16-year-old kids, 40-year-old kids. You know, they're all kids. You know, they're all kids because it's a game. And that's what, that's what we have to learn. So again, like I'm, you know, like, more than happy to, you know, like to be here in Latvia and spend time with you. So let's work this as a group. Don't be shy. There's no stupid questions. If you agree, if you disagree, if you have comments, please just stand up and, you know, like let's make this, let's make this a fun day. Like uh, I'm looking forward to work uh, even more with you guys after. You know, like uh, I have ideas after the World Championship to maybe get on the ice and share some, some details or little tricks that we, we can teach our players. But, you know, like uh, that's what you know. So today, you know, I kind of prepared a general, general view of coaching. Oh, how to run a practice, how to use assistance and stuff like this. But, you know, like so we are going to get going. Well, why coach? What's, what's the real definition of coaching? Why are we here today? Why do we get on the ice? Why do we prepare practice? Why do we get on a, 
why, why do we get on the ice with our kids? And, you know, like, obviously, as we all know, we have a job that reporters, fans, parents are watching us by the second. We're sitting under a giant microscope. You know, the way you dress, the way you comb, you know, the way you walk, the way you coach, the way you treat people, you know, the way you win, it's all areas where you're going to be looking for. First, you know, like I really believe, you know, to teach details and the enjoyment of the game. You know, like it's, this is a game. This is, you know, like, and I'm a big believer that, you know, like, what's the right age before starting to win? Because you're, you're three years old and you want to win. But, you know, at five years old, at eight years old, at ten years old, if I'm a coach, what's more important to teach? Teach about winning or teach about working hard, having respect, learning the game, learning the game. You know, like anywhere, whether it's Canada, U.S., anywhere, Europe, you hear about coaches that some seven-year-old players don't touch the ice in the third period in a 2-2 game because the coach wants to win. Oh, is this how we're going to promote the game? On top of being a coach, you're a salesman. You're selling the game. You're selling the game to parents. You're selling the game oh, to uh, little Peters. Little Peters, he's going back home after practice. He has a neighbor. He has a neighbor of six years old that isn't playing sport. And maybe little Peters had so much fun at practice that he gets right back at home, gets his stick, and starts shooting a tennis ball in the driveway. And the little neighbor comes in and said, what are you doing? Well, I'm playing hockey and my coach is so nice. I'm having fun. Well, you know what? Maybe next week that little neighbor will want to play hockey. Maybe he's running home and telling mom and dad, I want to do like little Peters. I want to be on Peter's team. And suddenly we have one more hockey player. We have two more hockey players. We have three more hockey players. Especially in Latvia, the geography of, you know, like of the country, it's a very small country. The population is small. You know, how can we build like a strong ice hockey federation you know, like with small number of hockey players. Number one, we have to grow hockey players, you know, to grow the number. Number one, the number that we have, we can't afford to lose one kid. Okay? We can't afford to lose one kid, but at the same time, can we get the number bigger? I think the easy answer is yes. You can always make it easy. And Never mind the excuses of all, oh, like, you know, there's tennis, there's basketball, there's this, there's this. Yes, you know, and on top of, you know, like, the big job we have to do, because there's lots of pressure on us, because hockey is a very expensive sport. Okay? Hockey is not for a poor family. Okay? Like, it's tough. Like, you know, like, you get, you buy the, the sticks, you buy the skates. Wow, you know, like it's lots of money. Then you rent an hour of ice at, I don't know, 250 euros, 300 euros an hour. That's lots of money compared to the kid that can play soccer on, you know, like on a field. You know, like, uh, you know, like it's much cheaper to play many other sports than hockey. So there's lots of pressure on us to make hockey a special sport, to say, wow. We're doing it, you know, like to teach kids about teamwork and respect. It's not only, hockey's not only about skating and passing and scoring goals and winning games. It's a school. Just like kids come to school over here, if they have good teachers in this school, they're going to teach them maths. They're going to teach them about history, about geography, you know, like maybe about French. You know, but at the same time, they need to teach them about life. They see someone that is bullying a kid or 
someone that is trying to smoke in the rain in, in the school or someone that has bad manners, if I'm a good teacher, I'm going to grab that kid alone and say, listen, you need to clean up your act. Oh, you can be a good person because I don't believe that you can be a good teammate and a good hockey player if you're not a good person. And that's, that's a major challenge. So I think that it's very important. Oh, like teach kids about life, be a better person, talk about school and family. And you know, like maybe that seven-year-old kid, oh, that seven-year-old kid on your team might be the next best doctor in Latvia, or might be the biggest lawyer, or might be the best farmer. He might not make it to the NHL or to, to the national team. Who cares? They, they can't all make it. Oh, they can't all make it. But at the same time, how do we work around the kids you know, to teach them about hockey, teach them about respect, teach them about fun, teach them about life? Because in 20 years, 25 years, it's going to be their turn to bring their kid to the rink. Oh, and if you do a good job with them, hockey is going to keep growing in popularity and airing, and that's how, that's how it goes. You know, for the oldest one, hey, don't be afraid to talk about the danger of drugs and alcohol. And how many careers, how many players scrap their career because of drugs and, and alcohol? You know, it's a major problem. It's a major problem. And don't wait to 20 years old to start talking about this. You know, you know the age where drugs are, are around the kids and everything, like the 12, 13, 14 years old. That's the, every age is tough to coach. But I believe that those are the danger years. Danger years where a kid can meet a bad friend and take a left turn and suddenly school goes down, hockey goes down. Why? Because he's stuck in drinking or he's stuck in drugs. And, you know, like I, I had a player in, uh, in Calgary. I had, over my career, I had quite a few players, but we had like a native, uh, a native young man, you know, like that, you know, like start to drink at a very young age. And as soon as Jacques and I got to Calgary, he was a rookie. We just drafted him. And we saw the potential on that kid, big kid, strong. Great shot, great hockey player, and great kid. But he had one major problem. He was drinking since probably the age of 12, 13 years old. And he had a major problem. And that costed him, costed him one year, two years. Then he had a bad knee injury in the American League. We brought him with us in, in Calgary to do the rehab with our doctors and with our guys, plus we wanted him around the NHL team in order to make him grow a little bit. And every morning, my conditioning coach was saying, oh, yesterday he was good. Whoop, the next day, he wasn't good. He had no energy. He was tired. He was white. And whoop, the next morning, I'd go to the, back, the bathroom, and I could hear him at 7.30 in the morning, sick and throwing up and everything. And you know what? Like, I start to think, and I had, I had heard some stories about, you know, like going in bars and drinking and everything, and I sat with him quite a few times till the time that he started to cry, and he said, yes, I have a problem. Oh, and we sent him to rehab. Today, he's the father of a beautiful little girl, and he's playing in the NHL, and he's sober. Oh, and I'm not a hero. Oh, but I told him, I said, I don't really care about your career. I, and I care about your career, but I care a lot more about your life. Oh, that you don't make it as a hockey player, maybe not everyone can make it as a hockey player. But that you don't make it as a good man, that's my job. That's my job. And he started to cry, and we got him. And like I said, he's playing for the Calgary Flames. And he's been in the NHL now for, for three years. You know? And it's all things that, you know, you don't have to go that far. But, you know, like warn them. Bring, 
bring, bring a policeman. You have a policeman that is a friend of yours, bring him and ask him, can you come and talk to my team for 10, 15 minutes about drugs and alcohol, about how those kids get in jail? No? If you help only one kid out of the group, no? it's worth it. It's worth it. No? Like, and that's coaching. That's coaching hockey because you coach hockey, you coach life. No? You want good people. You want to be proud. Those kids, they'll see you in 15, 20, 30 years. And they'll shake hands and they'll give you a hug. And you know what? That's going to be your paycheck. That's going to be your reward. You're going to say, wow, I did a great job with this kid. Obviously, if he makes it to the NHL like Sanders Ozelinch and Arthur Zirby and Ronald Kennans and everything, or plays on the national team, hey, you feel good about this. But if he's a good man, you know, in everyday's life, hey, you still did a great job. You still did a great job, and you have to appreciate this. Hey? Develop and maximize potential of every kid. Hey? Every kid, it's a team, but you need a plan where you're going to be able to have an individual plan. You have a big kid that is kind of clumsy a little bit, well, you'll have to work maybe on his, on his foot speed. Oh, and it might take a little long time than the small kid that skates like a road runner. It's easy because he's small. Oh, like, but he might be small, but he might be weak. Oh, like the, the thing that you know, like we get with many hockey players when they get to the pro level, they say, oh, I'm a scorer. I can't play defense. Hey, or, and we ask them, how many goals do you have this year? And we're at the end of the year and they say, oh, uh, I have three goals. Well, you're a goal scorer with three goals and you can't play defense. How are we going to win? You know, but I don't blame the kid. That's a mentality. You know, the kid over the years, you know, like probably got some coaches that told them, you don't need to play defense. Just score goals. Just score goals. You know what, like those guys, I don't believe you can, uh, you know, like you can win with them. Or at the same side, I never told a player, your job is just to play defense. No. You need to score goals. You need players that can play the full sheet of ice. No. You know, like hockey is a game of speed where you might have the defenseman joining the rush. And if he doesn't join the rush, he might not score that goal. No, he just can't sit back and wait. He needs to move and go. So, like, no, please give them the mindset that you're going to maximize their talent individually, but as a team, in the team concept, they need to play the full game. They need to play de You need to play defense when your team has the puck. The better you're going to play defense, quicker you go on offense. So I think there's a... There's a huge reward. Then you go on, on offense, you lose the puck. It's not only the job of the goalie and the two defensemen to suddenly save the planet. No, everyone needs to come back. It's a block of five guys moving, transition to offense, transition to defense, back to offense. You know, like work, work that way so that, you know, like they understand the full game so that if for kids, who want to go high, they understand the game. Just look, Google NHL draft. Go five, six, seven years ago. All those kids now should be in the NHL. Look first round picks. Look second round picks. Those are, and when you're drafted in the NHL, many teams, the scouts, are rating talent. Okay? Raw talent. They're they're predicting the kid's going to get stronger physically, stronger mentally, is going to mature, but the talent is there. How come a kid, you know, teams in the NHL, they spend hundreds of thousands of dollars on scouting. They go around the world. They have scouts in Russia. They have scouts in, in Switzerland, in Sweden, in Finland, and they travel. They travel. They go and see tournaments everywhere. There are scouts in in the U.S. and Canada, so they cover the entire hockey planet. 
And they see this kid and they say, wow, this kid can play. This kid has talent. Three years after the draft, you don't even know where the kid is. You don't even know where the kid is. Hey, not in the NHL and somewhere, gone, playing in little leagues. Why? Hey, he had talent, but he didn't know how to play the game. Didn't know how to make his team win. You give him the puck in the practice, he looks like a million dollar player. You put him in a game, lost. No compete. No compete, no grit, no will to commit to, to team concept. It might only not be the fault of the kid. Oh, somewhere there's coaches that told them, you're a good scorer, do what you want. You know what, you're not helping the kid if you're doing this. You have to teach him the proper way. Everyone on the team should have the same rules. And yes, that kid is make us, making us win as a coach, it's, you know, human nature to say, ah, good job, kid, good job. You don't need to back check. Well, you know what? In the NHL, if he wants to win a Stanley Cup and if he wants to play in the, Stan in the NHL, he has to back check. Oh, so like, you know, sometimes make sure, and it's not, and, it, and what if he doesn't have the talent to play in the NHL? The details that you show them about commitment to teamwork will help him in every job he's going to do. Oh, you're a doctor, you, you have a, you're in a surgery, well, you're not working alone. You have other doctors around yourself, you have helpers, you need to communicate and everything. That's so important. All right, so let's make sure that we're, we're, looking, we're looking at this. Okay. Communicate with kids at all time. Find a way to be positive. You can come in and say, you guys were awful. That's easy. That's not positive. No? You know, you can tell them, guys, you know what? You guys worked so hard last week. You guys are such great workers, but I don't know what you've done today. Today was not acceptable. You guys are better than this. Right? You guys are better than this. So that way, you know, like, it's... You know, like, it's the way to do things because you should be a reason why kids want to come to the rink. If you yell constantly at kids and hey, suddenly to come to the rink is not fun. They get in the car with their mom and dad and they say, hockey's not fun. Hockey's not fun. Hey, you are responsible to make it fun for the kids. Hey, you have to work with your partners and say we're going to be talking about your assistance later on, you need to find a way to motivate those kids. Hey, that, you know, like they, they want to come, they want to come to the, to the rink, you know, like be one of the reasons why kids, hey, they come in, a kid, little seven-year-old kid, little 12-year-old kid comes in the car after practice, you know, and say, Dad, when is next practice? You know, Coach Anders told me I worked hard. Oh, sometimes just try to talk to everyone. Jacques and I were always the first at, at the rink. When staff come in, we make sure we talk to every staff. Then we walk around the players. The players are having a coffee. How's your kids? Hey, how's your leg? How are you doing? Then we get on the ice. We make sure we talk to every player, whether it's one minute, whether it's five minutes. Hey, make them feel that, hey, they're special. Hey, how school? How school? Hey, oh, coach, I had, I had a good report card. Way to go, Billy. Good job. You know what? You're connecting with them. You're connecting with them. And the one thing that I see over here, I watch uh, the, the national junior team play in Toronto. I've watched under 20 practice. I've watched under 16 practice. It looks like a funeral home. No one talk. The kid is going for the puck and gets the pass. They're silent. Get them to communicate. This is, this is a team game. This is a team game. We're going to talk about practices, but communication you know, starts, starts with you. 
the child versus the athlete, the player, or like the, the, the person, the person versus the athlete. Okay? I give motivational speeches to, to companies in Canada and the U.S. You know, about how to motivate employees and everything. Do you motivate the player or you motivate the kid? Have you ever, have you, have you ever thought of this? You made a, do you motivate the player or you motivate the kid? Anyone has any ideas? Huh? Hey, you motivate the kid, you motivate the person. The player, you teach him to skate, you teach him to shoot, you teach him the game. But the person, you motivate the person. My next question, how can you motivate the person if you don't know the person? Ask every player that spent the last four days with us. Jacques and I and Artus Abel and Sandra Sosa Lynch, we met the players one by one. Okay. Who are you? Who are you as a person first? There's two things that are important. The person, the player. And you need to know both. Okay. Are you married? Are you single? One or many girlfriends? How many kids? No. Where do you live? What do you do? Okay. Where did you play your, your minor hockey? Oh, and then, who are you as a player? Are you a hard worker? Are you a scorer? Are you a defender? Why do you want to be on the Latvian national team? That's important, because you know what? It gives us ingredients then to, to start moving. To start moving. Now we kind of have a picture of every player, because you know what, like I talked to you about the player that if we wouldn't have look around that kid who had the drinking problem, do you think that that kid would be in the NHL today? No, the answer is easy. Okay. Did we help the player or we helped the person there? We helped the person. And now the person is an NHL player. And that's so important. So you have kids that you don't know what's going on at home. You might have a kid that at four o'clock this morning, mom and dad were having kind of a little fight and yelling and airing and that kid was crying. And then tonight, he shows up to practice. Will he have a good practice? What are the chances that this kid has, has a good practice? Okay. Chances are that he'll probably be one of your worst players at practice. Right? Because he didn't sleep, he didn't have enough sleep, he's tired, so he's not sharp mentally, physically, yeah, has no gas. Or maybe in school, he got a great news, he was voted president of his class, so now he's all pumped, so now he's going to have a good practice. But if you connect with those kids, that's how it is. Or maybe dad, after the game, he sits, he sits him in the car going back home and he plays the game again. You should have done this, and you should have done this, and you should have done this, and don't listen to your coach. He doesn't know how to coach. Huh? Does this exist in Latvia? It exists in North America also. So it's all the same. It's all the same. You know? But this kid suddenly is mixed up. So you need to find out, and the only way you're going to find out those things is by sitting with the kids. Does it take time? Yes, it takes time. No? How many of you guys are volunteer? Yeah, how many, are you guys all getting money paid? Yeah, well, at least that's good. But at the same time, you know, it takes lots of time. It's long days. It's really long days. Okay? So like, let's make sure that, you know, like we keep up this. Your assistants, your assistants, everywhere I go, I bring Jacques with me. Why I bring Jacques? Because I trust him. And he was a player. I watched him play goal. I, I, didn't know, I didn't know Jacques. I'm from Ontario. He's from Quebec. I had never met Jacques. Hey, I met Jacques in his last year as a goalie in Quebec. And I was an assistant coach. And in training camp, we were just skating around before practice. And I started to talk with him. And he told me, he said, it's probably my last season. And next day, 
I could see him work, and I could see his passion and his commitment, and suddenly in my head I said, hmm, maybe this guy can be an assistant. The next day I asked him, I said, at the end of this season, if you announce your retirement, you want to be a coach? Yeah, maybe. Okay. So I went to my boss and I said, next year, I'd like to work with him. And you know, we've been together, you know, like, like I told you before, for 12, uh, for 12 years. Why do I always want him around me? Because I trust him. I trust him. But at the same time, eh, the biggest thing that I don't want is to be a yes man. No, the coach gets in the room and starts yelling at the players and da 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 or whatever he does and the assistant comes right behind and good job you gave it to them you know that's not exactly if he thinks I did right I respect him for telling me you did the right thing but whatever I did he's always around me if I do something bad after in the, the office say I don't agree with you. That's a good assistant coach. That an assistant coach who's like a bobblehead and always go, yeah, yeah, yeah. He doesn't make you better. He doesn't make you better because suddenly you always do what you want. Give him jobs and ask him. Oh, and tell your assistant, don't be shy. If you see that I don't do a good job or I'm wrong in the way that I treated a kid or I didn't do a good job at practice or on the bench, I lost control, right away, go to the coach and say, hey, hey, shh, calm down. Not in front of the kids, just give him a little tap and say, calm down, calm down. That's an assistant coach. That's a good assistant coach. On the flip side, use your assistant coach. Oh, when we're going to be talking about practices or games, give them jobs. Hey, we're promoting fun with the kids. If your assistants have no jobs, are they having fun? No, if they're standing behind the bench in a game and they don't do nothing, well, by the second period, their feet are frozen and they're like this and they're looking at the clock and they're hoping that the clock runs out. You know, do you think this guy has fun? If the assistants and the coach don't have fun, how can the kids have fun? We are responsible for making it fun for the kids. Hey, do you agree? Hey, you, the kids will not have fun if they don't see that you as a group of coaches, you have fun. You have to be tight. You have to be tight. You're the head coach, they're the assistants, but you form a team because at the end of the day, we all win or we all lose. It's, it, has to be, it has to be together. It has to be together. Okay? Be a good mirror. Okay? As an assistant coach, okay? who has a mirror in his house? Who has a mirror in his house? Everyone has a mirror, right? What's the job of a mirror? Can someone tell me what's the job? Can you tell me what's the job of a mirror? Huh? A reflection. A reflection, exactly. Does the job of a mirror is to make you look good? Huh? You know, the first game I coach in, uh, in Calgary, I always say this, I get in after the first period and I look at my phone because sometimes the general manager is on the press box and he's going to text, you know, like, you know, like, watch this or do this or watch for this, you know, like, give positive reinforcement. And I had a text from my sister. And I said, my sister texts me between the first and second period. So I look at it and she said, fix your tie, it's crooked. You know, my tie was like this on TV. She was looking at the game. The next morning, I got my equipment manager and I said, listen, go and buy me a mirror. Put it behind the door of my office. So after every period, after, before going back on the bench, what do you think I would do? I would look in the mirror to make sure my tie was straight to keep my sister happy. No, but at the same time, my si why my sister told me my tie was crooked? She wanted me to look good. Well, it's the same thing. 
If you're a good assistant, you're a good mirror for your head coach. All what you do, you support him and you tell him, hey, good job. Uh, mm, not so good. And don't be afraid. And if you're a head coach, be open to this and ask them, what do you guys think? Don't be rah, rah, rah. It's my way or the highway. It doesn't work. You know, like we connected real well with Artis Abel's uh, last four days. We had lots of fun. And look, he is Latvian and we're Canadian. We work, we work together. I got in at the Federation in the office with Oksana and, you know, like uh, Peters, like we didn't know Peters, Aldis, uh, Edgars, you know, everyone. We work as a team. And you know what? We have smile. Get in in the morning and Labrit and, you know, like an airing and people are smiling. And it doesn't mean we're going to win, but at least it's positive. It's not negative. If it's negative, you have no chance. If it's positive, you have a chance to build something. So make sure your assistants are important. And early in the year, set some roles and make sure everyone in practice has a job, not only just pushing pucks. You know, like, and you know, like talk, communicate, com communicate with your group, communicate with the kids. So important. Be active in practice and games, so important. Have a plan before dealing with kids and parents. You know, have a plan. You know, and have that plan, and once in a while, every two, three weeks, do a little meeting. Hey, go for a beer somewhere after a game. Hey, go to a restaurant, or, you know, like bring your assistants at home and say, okay, it's two, three weeks now. Rate yourself. Are we doing a good job? Hey, are we doing a good job in games? Are we doing a good job in practice? Are we doing a good job dealing with parents and kids? Hey, parents pay money, pay big money to play hockey. They're part of the team. In the pros, we shake hands with parents and, hey, how are you doing? And it's over. Hey. In minor hockey, sometimes you need parents meeting because if they feel that you don't include them, then they start piak, 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 and it's not fun. And you know what? They have the right, in a way, to do this because if they feel that there's no communication, when there's no communication, that's where the doubts are starting. And one parent's going to go to the other parent, and what do you think about the coaches? And this, 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 and suddenly again, it becomes negative. If it becomes negative, it's no fun for you. If it's no fun for you, it's no fun for the kids. It's a, it's a circle. It's a circle. So we, you need to plan. You need to plan and evaluate your plan. So important. Don't be afraid to say, I made a mistake. Hey, what's wrong? Life is about mistakes. The game of hockey is about mistakes. We can do seminars like this every day. You can do video sessions every day with your players. You know what? The next day, there are going to still be mistakes. And that's okay, as long as there's respect, hard work, and commitment. Those are the three things that I'm always asking. The rest, play, have fun. You, know? we're, you make mistakes, we're going to teach you about the, those mistakes. We're going to correct the mistakes. But have fun, work hard, let's show respect. The yearly plan, eh? the yearly plan, you, you need to sit early on with your, your assistants and design a plan. And I think that the Federation, talking with the Federation, they're, they, 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 them too, they have a plan. You know? And you know what, that's the reason I took the job, because I feel that they have a plan, they want to build hockey. You know, like, you can't expect like the 25-year-old player that suddenly is competing for the national team that, you know, like was kind of lost a little bit and suddenly, wow, we need to make, to make him a champion. It's a little late. You know, it's still possible, but, you know, like the 5 years old, the 7 years old, the 9 years old, the 11 years old, 13 years old, 15 years old. If you start at 5 and as a federation you have a plan, 
and then as a coach, you have your own plan, but your own plan matches the Federation plan, oh, because you can put your own ways of working while respecting the Federation's plan, that's where you're going to build something strong in Latvia. And I believe that we have two buddies from Estonia. Is that right? Who's from Estonia? All right. Thank you for coming. Thank you for coming. See, we have some cousins. All right. So, like, you know, like that's the, you know, like that, that's important. Like, you know, like build something strong, build something that, you know, like you're, you're strong. And again, it's not only about, about winning. It's not only about winning. It depends, always depend. The worst thing that you guys can do, you know, is compare yourself to pros. Okay? Like, I was in Atlanta one day. And I, I just got in Atlanta, like I got the job in January. So my wife was still in Colorado selling the house and packing boxes. And uh, so I don't cook. So there was a restaurant in our practice rink, like on the second floor, and I could see, I could see the ice. So I sit right on the window and I start to eat, and there was little seven-year-old kids practicing. The coach gets on the ice, and I'm, and obviously I like to evaluate. I like to see how people do things. So, runs one drill and pretty good drill. I said, "Wow!" I said, "That's pretty good." Then, blows a whistle, and the kids go at center ice just like a pro team and start stretching. They stretch for 15 minutes. I'm going crazy up there. I said, you know, like, and now we're a ice in Atlanta, and number one, there's basically no arenas in Atlanta. Big city like Atlanta, when I was there, I think that we had four rinks. So teams get one hour of practice a week because there's no ice. And you spend 15 minutes with seven-year-old kids stretching like the pros, and seven-year-old kids When's the last time a seven-year-old kid pulled a groin? You know, they're like, they're like gumbies, you know, like they're, you know, like they, they don't break. They're like elastic bands. You know, before practice, have them stretch, if you want to stretch on the ice, teach them about hockey. You know, like, so anyways, like, you know, and he runs a pretty decent practice after, but he's did a practice of uh, first drill of five minutes, Stretch 15 minutes. How much is this? 20 minutes out of 50 minute practice. There's only 30 minutes left for hockey. So I keep eating and everything. He comes up for a beer after and he says, hey, Coach Hartley, how are you doing? I said, he said, can I sit? I said, sure, sit. And we start to talk and great guy, great guy. And I said, can I ask you a question? I said, why did you stretch those kids for 15 seconds? I said, uh, 15 minutes. I said, I was going crazy upstairs. Oh, he said, I come since you took the job for the last two weeks. He said, I don't miss one practice. He said, I come and see all of your practices. He said, you see, I did a few of your drills. So, you know, like the coach had a business, so he, you know, he was pretty rich. And he had lots of employees. So when I took the job, every morning, he would come and watch our practice. But in the NHL, we have three hours of ice a day. We don't have 50 minutes. Plus, we're coaching guys of 30 years old, 35 years old, 40 years old. So we need to warm them up, and we need to stretch them on top of warming them up and stretching them in, in the gym before practice. Because obviously we want to avoid injuries. But see, this guy looked at me and did exactly what I was doing at the pro level. Sometimes, yes, you can learn tricks and stuff like this, but you cannot make the mistake of treating kids like pro hockey players. It, it's not there. There's no balance. Okay? You, you need to take some stuff. You can come and watch us practice and learn some drills and everything. No problem with the drills.
But at the same time, the, mind, the mindset of a 7-year-old kid, a 12-year-old kid, and a 30-year-old pro is not the same. It doesn't work. You need to adjust. Oh, I have a big hockey camp in, uh, in York, Pennsylvania in the summer. When I get there, I'm not a professional hockey coach. I'm a kid. I go down to their level. I don't expect them to be adults. So I tell my coaches, we have to think like a bunch of kids. We have to go down to their level so that we can teach them and make fun. I can't expect a 10-year-old kid to stick handle like Johnny Goodrow that I had in, in Calgary, or shoot the puck like Joe Sackick that I had in Colorado, or pass the puck on defense like Sanders Ozelinch that I coach in Colorado. Oh, it's a matter of common sense, all right? What do we want to do in our, in our plan? Technical, okay. learn about techniques. Show them how to, to skate proper way. Stop the proper way, turn the proper way. Carry the puck the proper way. Oh. After this, tactical. Tactical is how do you protect a puck? How do you fight a one-on-one, -on -one, both offensively, defensively? How a two-on-one, -on -one, a three-on-two, a three-on... And then after this, systems, four checks, back checks, defensive zone, power plays, uh, penalty killing, all those. But again, systems for six, seven, eight, nine, ten years old, I don't think they're very important. I see even in Canada or the U.S., coaches at seven-year-old kids in September practicing like four checks and hey, the kids can't even skate. Huh? The kids can't even skate, they can't even make a pass. But it's more important to show them how to break out. Oh, it doesn't make sense. In order to break out, you need to skate, you need to get your head up, you need to pass, you need to talk, then you break out. But for some of them, they want to break out first. And passes are all over the place. Kids have no clue what they're doing. And the coach is yelling at them. So is it fun? But the recipe, the recipe is not good. No, the recipe is not good. You need baby steps, baby steps. And again, that's what I told you, meeting the federation. That's, that's their mindset also. They want to build a plan where, you know, you need to learn to walk before you run. You know, and as a coach, Yes, we want to get so quick and we want those nice breakouts and those power plays. Why? Because human nature, we want to... What do we want to do? Win. We want to win. We want to win. No, because it's in our blood. It's normal. We buy lottery tickets. Huh? You have lottery tickets in Latvia? Huh? Why there's casinos? Why there's casinos? Why there's casinos? People go there with 100 euros and they think within an hour they're going to leave with a million euros. Most of them, they leave the casino with what? Zero. Okay? But they take the hook because they want to win. They think winning is easy. Okay? So in hockey, at minor hockey, winning, I'm not going to say it's not important because you want to teach the kids to be competitive and everything, but teach them to play. Feel good about yourself that you get in the, and say, kids, we worked hard, we were respectful, hey, we did lots of good things, we're heading the right way. And that has to be communicated to the parents at the start of the year, at the start of the year, because parents want to win too. Hey, why is he playing everyone? It's 2-2. Two, two. Why is he playing everyone? Because he's doing his job. He wants every kid to have fun. Why little Edgars is sitting in the corner and he didn't play for 10 minutes because it's 2-2? Two, two. Huh? Who cares that it's 2-2? Two, two? Uh, or who cares that we're down 2-1? Hey, it's not about us. It's about the kids. 
It's, a, it's our commitment that we're going to teach the kids the right way. Okay? The right way. Conditioning. I was so impressed when I got to, to Zurich. As Jacques, before every practice, there were soccer fields beside every rink. Teams would be in the soccer field with their sweatsuit, with soccer balls, cones, and everything, and even plastic sticks with balls. And they'd, they'd stick handle through cones and do plyometrics and everything. And we started camp with the pros, and we had kids of 18, 19, 20 years old, like muscular, big legs, and jump and run and everything. You know what? Switzerland, and obviously I, I can't come in here because I didn't see enough, but from my year that I spent in Switzerland, they're doing lots of good things because on top of teaching hockey, they make good athletes out of those kids. Oh, they make them athletes because they make them work on their conditioning. They, they make them work on their body before they get on the ice. Before they get on the ice. You know, because with 50 minutes, how, how many times you practice in a week? What's the average? Yeah, I know it depends on teams, but, you know, like uh, seven-year-old kids. Seven-year-old kids, how many times they practice in a week? Two. You know what? Two. It's okay, but is it a lot? But if you maximize those two sessions with hey, running through cones, doing sit-ups, uh, teaching them how to do plyometrics, and to, to get a little faster, to get a little stronger, to get a little bit more competitive, you know? again, you're developing hockey players, you're developing kids who will become men in the near future, and you're teaching them about hard work. Like, not crazy work, not army work, but work that needs to be done so that when the kid gets in a junior tryout, whether in Latvia or in North America or in Russia, he doesn't get off, he doesn't get pushed off the puck because suddenly he's too weak. Right? He never learned to work out, he never learned to compete. Okay. Team building. Okay. Birthdays. Every time there's a birthday, do you bring, do you, number one, do you know the birthdays of your players? Okay. Or maybe on one day, little Edgars was voted president of his class. No. Do a little something, or maybe after practice, do a little bowling tournament with the parents, to show the parents that you care about the kids and we go for a little burger and it's a birthday, we bring a cake and candles and everything and the parents are saying, wow, he cares about my kid. He cares about my kid. That's team building. That's showing that you care for people. Right? Parents meeting. Parents meeting you need to start your season with a parents' meeting. Once you know who's on your team before the season starts, you need a parents' meeting like this. Okay? And you can tell them who you are, what's your, what's your philosophy, and you know, like all what you're going to do. Okay? But you need to, to tell them, to ask them. You know? If it's too too tie, do you think that it's right that in the last 10 minutes, I sit little Edgars that is not very good. Should I sit little Edgars? Make them talk. Make them talk. Oh? Because you didn't lose a game, you didn't win a game yet. So it's time to set the rules. Time to set the rules. You know, we go in another city, we're promoting Latvia, we're promoting Riga, we're pr promoting uh, Jurmala, we're promoting Estonia. So we don't fight with other parents. We cheer for our team. Other people around the ring are saying, wow, this team, sharp on the ice, sharp parents. We're promoting hockey. We don't want a, one dad to fight with the other dad of your team or 
start throwing stuff at the referee on the ice. And suddenly they say, wow, look at that team from Riga. Not very smart. Oh, and all this, but you need to talk and say, hey, plus we're going to have birthday parties with the kids. We're going to do this. You set up a plan. We're planning to play in four tournaments. That's how it's going to go. And the parents are sitting there and they're saying, wow, this guy is organized. This guy knows what he's doing. You know? And coaching, that's half of the battle. If you show players, if you show parents, if you show fans that you know that what you're doing, that you're organized, well, that's a good start. But if you're all over the place and I don't know what's going on and I don't know, well, parents are saying, like, what a clown. Well, my kid's going to play for this guy? And as soon as something goes wrong a little bit, goes to another parent and say, this guy should be out and everything, and they're on your case. Remember, we're sitting under a big microscope. They're watching us. They're watching us every, every second. Okay, like I'll just start the other one. So, oh, no, I, we're not done. So, what do, you, what do you think about, you said tactical and, and uh, all, all those things about, let's say, systems, uh, it's all about when kids are prepared, or is it certain age, or till some age they should, we should not even touch that, or? No, the, the tactical and technical, I think it should start right at the start. Systems, for me, systems before like 11, 20, or 12 years old, we shouldn't even touch this. Because if you have no speed, if you can't skate with your head up, if you don't talk on the ice, all those things, all those things, backward skating, forward skating. And for me, you know, while we're talking about the yearly plan, up to 10 years old. I coached my son, he was four years old. I would, uh, and the, the oldest kid was eight years old. I carried the goaltender, the goaltender equipment. Why? Because they had all number one, two, three, four, five, six until 12. Well, the first game, number one played goal. Game number two, who played goal? Number two. Game number three, who played goal? Number three. They all played goal. They all played defense. They all played center. They all played, played left wing. They all played... Who are we to tell a seven-year-old kid, your dad was a defenseman, you're a defenseman. Or, or you're big and slow, you're playing defense. Oh, well, who are we? You know, like, and we're talking about hockey sense, right? Uh, we all know what's hockey sense. You have something? Yeah, or, or the, yeah, exactly. Or the kid who couldn't skate. I remember when I played, my goalie couldn't skate. He would give, after the period, he would give us his stick and we would pull him to the other net. You know, games that... No, no, Jaco was good. Jaco still has records. And Jaco was 12 years old back in Quebec playing with 16-year-old kids. Like, Jaco's quick like a cat. He, uh, but, you know, like, at the same time, you know, like, it is so important that, you know, that, that's where the yearly plan, what do we want to do? And then you can adjust that yearly plan. You know, like adjust that yearly plan to a monthly plan and then to a weekly plan. But for, I know Eric's was coaching the under 20 and I can't remember your name, but you're coaching the under 18 and Eric. This is more competitive, so it's a little bit more complex. You need more planning. The, the yearly plan is much bigger. If you're coaching seven-year-old kids, the yearly plan is this big, but you need to find new drills, agility, speed, strength. Uh, you know, you can make, and make sure also that you teach the kids to be competitive. You know, like in, uh, you know, you can do all kinds of things. We're going to talk about practice later on. You know, you make sure that kids learn to compete. Right? 
But winning is not the only thing. Compete. Do your best. Do your best. Right? Because you can tell me, yeah, you're talking about competing. Competing is winning. Yeah, you're right. right? But you know what? I can lose a game and my kids competed hard, competed the right way, and I'm going to come in and say, good job, boys. Right? You gave everything you could. And can we ask, when, when someone or a team gives you all what they can, can you really ask for more? No, I don't think so. You know, you demand commitment, you demand the best from your players, you go. You know, so that's why, like, you know, like, divide the plan, talk about the plan, and that's serious. It has to be structured, and you need to go back to your plan and say, okay, where are we? Hey, well, our kids can only stop on one side because you will see that players were all the same. Do we like to do something that we're struggling with? Hey, anything. Hey, my wife tells me, uh, time to paint. I'm not good at, at painting. No, I call a painter and say, paint my house. Why? Because I'm not good at painting. I don't like it. Hey, well, if one kid can stop real good on one side and on the other side he goes and skate and go like this, well, what side does he always want to stop? He wants to stop on his good side because he knows he's doing it good. But you as a coach, your job is to teach him that he needs to stop on the wrong side because he needs to learn both sides, and that's a process. You need to communicate, you need to take time, you need to do it the right way, the right way. And then, then you say, okay, here's our yearly plan, we want to do this, this, this. Then you split, okay, you give a schedule to the parents, practice, practice, game, uh, Edgar's birthday, practice, practice, game, conditioning, gym, whatever, okay? and say, okay, what do we want to do we have a tournament there, so I'm talking to competitive teams. We need to make sure that, you know, like our conditioning is good, our systems are good, we're going to work on technique and tactics at the same time to make sure that we're going to incorporate. And later on, we're going to talk about building a practice so it starts from the yearly plan to the monthly plan to the weekly plan and then to the practice plan and keep those keep those put this in your computer put this on a piece of paper put this in a notebook with all the dates you know and I'll show you a little bit what what I do in order to keep track of my lines who's at practice who's there uh, what drills that I do so that you know exactly exactly what's going on so like you know like it is very important that if you're not organized, I'm telling you, you're going to fail. You're going to fail, and parents will notice this. For coaches who are coaching junior kids or pros, they will notice it, that you're not structured. Okay? And in hockey, as in life, if you're not structured, you leave it to luck. And you need luck sometimes to win. You know, you shoot and it hits the post, you know, and it just goes in. Well, it was a great shot, but it could have hit the post and go the other way, and the game would still going, uh, go, and the other team goes up the ice and they score. But we shot, we hit the post and went in. Okay? We got a little bit lucky. We're going to take it. But if we did all the right things, maybe hockey gods were on our side. But if you're not structured... You have no chance and you will have no fun because you're going to be criticized all the time. Players will have doubts on you. Older players will have doubts on you. For younger players, parents will be in the stands and look at this and say, what the hell is going on here? I'm paying money. Now they go to the federation. They say, this coach, we're wasting money. We're going to go and play other sport. And now they go to you and it's meetings and hey, is this fun? I don't think so. I don't think so. So it starts with a commitment, your assistant coaches, yourself. You need to bring in the parents. I talk to many coaches in North America and they say, no, 
No, no parents, no parents. They're part of the game. They pay the bills. They pay your salary. Because if we don't have players, we can't coach. No, we're not going to sit behind the bench by ourselves and you know, wait, tell the referees, sorry, can't play the game, I have no players. No, so we need to understand that our role is to surround the players, teach them, coach them, promote the game, promote fun, okay? make sure that it's good. All right, so like we're going to take... And we're going to take a 15-minute break. Before we go on break, we have plenty of time. Is there any questions or comments? And don't be afraid. There's no stupid questions. I, I do this. I'm very happy to be here, and I'm looking forward to meet. I already met a few, few of you guys, but I want to meet everyone. We, we want to work with you guys. We want to help you if we can. Edgar, let's take a little break. Let's come back for uh, 1345, 145. Okay? Yeah, but it's what? It's 1308.